criticism. He has published a translation with interpretive essay of Plato's Laws, making that dialogue far more accessible and therefore far, far more usable for both undergraduates and graduates um, throughout the country. He has edited a book, The Roots of Political Philosophy, which brings to um, audiences interested in the subject 10 Forgotten Socratic Dialogues. And he has edited The Rebirth of Classical Rationalism, a collection of essays of, of Leo Strauss. Professor Pangel is a straightforward and brilliant exponent of Leo Strauss's approach to political philosophy and discussing the philosophical significance of Strauss's scholarly enterprise. And he has done so with an integrity and a penetration that has brought some controversy on him and nothing but honor on his mentor. His two most recent book projects bear directly on the subject of this evening's talk. The Spirit of Modern Republicanism, The Moral Vision of the American Founders and the Philosophy of John Locke, which was published by the University of Chicago Press in 1988. And he is nearing the completion of the book uh, that he is working uh, on with his spouse, Lorraine Pangle, on the educational philosophies of the American Founders. It's called The Learning of Liberty, and it will soon be published by the University Press of Kansas. Both of these recent projects bring to our attention the interest in the cultivation of qualities necessary to sustain democracy. I hope you will uh, join me in welcoming Professor Pangel. Thank you very much for that very, uh, very flattering uh, introduction. And it's a great pleasure and an honor to be here at Kenyon College, about which I've heard a great deal and never had the pleasure of uh, yet before, but uh, I'm enjoying this very much. I look forward to your questions and critical comments. My topic is education, and uh, education is today, of course, very topical. Uh, let me enter my discussion by way of some reflections on our immediate situation. Uh, in a State of the Union address last January, the President of the United States, Bush, President George Bush, restated the themes and commitments enunciated at the Education Summit he had held six months earlier with the governors. He spoke of expanding programs to prepare disadvantaged preschool children to learn. Uh, he set as a goal a sharp increase in the percentage of students who complete high school. He spoke of the need to assess student performance at critical stages in their schooling in order, as he put it, to make diplomas mean something. Uh, he called for school discipline. Uh, now, each of these goals is worthy. But does their enunciation altogether add up to an adequate statement of the goals of public education policy? Or is not something missing? Isn't the most important thing missing? What seems to me most striking about the president's discussion of public education and about the discussion in the education summit that took place before and the statement in the about the, from the education summit that took place this fall is how little our chief executives have to say about the content of education. What was remarkable about the section of the State of the Union speech devoted to school was President Bush's almost complete silence about which sorts of lessons ought to be considered truly important. On only one point was there clarity, specificity, and there it was unmistakable, and I quote, by the year 2000, US students must be first in the world in math and science achievement. There was indeed a single passing reference in the context of a call for literacy to the fact that education must somehow prepare Americans to be citizens. But otherwise, the education being discussed might well be regarded as an education aimed simply at the acquisition of the skills needed to work and compete well in a modern technological global economy. Nothing testifies more vividly than the State of the Union Address to the loss in American democracy of clarity about the most important goals of public education in a Republican society. Now, I say the most important goal goal. For course, the concern for an education that prepares men and women to be effective 
useful members of the workforce is an essential and even a noble concern if or insofar as it is placed in a proper civic perspective. After all, skilled workers can be well-trained slaves. What makes the difference between a well-trained slave and a free human being? Doesn't education of a certain kind play an important, even the critical role in this regard? Shouldn't somebody in some state house, somewhere in the United States, know that and talk about it and think about it? Now, to this last question, the classical Republican tradition, the tradition founded by Socrates and immortalized by Plato, delivers a resounding affirmative answer. It is liberal education, to use Plato's great phrase, idea eleutherica, that makes the difference between a free human being and a slave. But what is liberal education? So fluffy and banal has this expression become in our time that we need to exert some effort to recover the original vibrant platonic meaning of this liberal educational ideal as first articulated in Plato's laws and republic and re-articulated in Aristotle's politics and also in Xenophon's great education of Cyrus. To quote Plato's chief interlocutor in the laws, what defines a liberal education in contradistinction to an illiberal education, however sophisticated and elaborate, is this. Liberal education is the education from childhood in virtue that makes one desire and love to become a perfect citizen who knows how to rule and to be ruled with justice. Now, education in Republican citizenship and knowing how to rule others and to be ruled in turn by others with justice, an education that induces a passionate, erotic, loving commitment to civic participation, direct participation in a just political order, that doesn't exhaust the meaning of liberal education in the original platonic sense of the term, but it's the heart of what Plato primarily means by liberal education. And the most important stages of such an education, the Athenian stranger goes on to argue in the laws, are the early stages, beginning at three, when habits, tastes, and aspirations are formed, when heroes and objects of emulation and reverence are set before the imagination's eye, when a communal sense of shared destiny is shaped, when Gratitude to the past and responsibility for the future is instilled. When capacities for collective deliberation and argument, and debate, and then action for leadership and loyalty are discovered, <coughs> tested, and celebrated. Now the curriculum for this kind of education should be centered on poetry, Plato argues, on music, on dance, on song, saga, on history and drama, and above all, on religion. This early civic and moral and religious public education is aimed mainly at the formation of the character, the heart, if you will, not so much of the mind. And this means to say that liberal education, in this classical sense, has another, higher dimension beyond civic education of free citizens. And this higher dimension in its strictest sense, is what Plato calls philosophy. Understood not as a way of thinking, or as a set of methods, or as something you learn in school, but as a way of life exemplified by a certain human being, Socrates. And that means a life centered on what Socrates calls in the Republic dialectics. And dialectics means the unwavering cross-examination the ruthless and radical question of one's most cherished commitments, one's most precious opinions about the humanly most important matters. It means raising and intransigently pursuing the questions, what is justice? What is love? What is nobility? What is piety? What is God? Now, this higher sense of liberal education 
cannot, however, according to Plato, be directly cultivated in any public schooling whatsoever. At most, public schooling can prepare the ground upon which individuals in informal and always marginal groups of friends can nourish true philosophic education. And yet Plato makes it unmistakably clear in both the Republic and the Laws that while no public schooling can teach philosophy, philosophic education, understood as centered on dialectics, presupposes an earlier passionate and profound moral and civic commitment, which does depend, to a large extent, on the less intellectual civic dimension of liberal education and therefore on public school. Now why, why exactly according to Plato, does philosophic <coughs> education, liberal education in its higher, rarer sense, depend so much on civic education and religious education, liberal education in the primary sense? Because, according to Plato, it's on the basis of the earlier formation of passionate moral commitments that alone can be founded the seriousness, the intensity, the serious need and quest for the truth, which Plato's Socrates makes clear is an essential precondition of true dialectics as opposed to sophistry. It's this moral seriousness, this quest for the truth, permanent and, and uh, universal truth. That is the foundation for the most fundamental distinction in Plato between the philosophers or lovers of philosophy and the intellectuals or the traffickers in ideas who love the sound of their names. And hence, from the classical point of view, there's every reason to focus our discussion of public education <coughs> on civic and moral education. Now, it's only fair to note that the President of the United States State of the Union Address did, contrary to initial appearances and to what the impression I've given thus far, and unlike any of the governor's declarations I've seen thus far, make room for some substantial and serious reference to liberal education in this primary classical Republican sense. But what's remarkable and yet so familiar and indeed characteristic of our world is that the president treated the themes of moral education and religious education not in the context of his discussion of public school, but rather in his peroration, where he dwelt on the themes of faith and family. There, the president exhorted grandparents, our living link to the past, as he put it, to, I quote, tell the story of struggles waged at home and abroad, of sacrifices freely made for freedom's sake. He then reminded parents that your children look to you for direction and guidance. Tell them, he urged, of faith and family. Tell them that we are one nation under God. Teach them that of all the many gifts they can receive, liberty is their most precious legacy, and of all the gifts they can give, the greatest, the greatest is helping others. In a tradition that reaches back to Pericles, the president invoked the morally educative, rhetorical authority of the Supreme Republican Magistracy to tell people how to live and how their children should be brought up. But in a tradition that is distinctively modern and deeply embedded in America, the president kept that higher part of his speech carefully out of his discussion of public education. Now, the philosophic basis for this distinctively liberal or modern Republican vision of education, where the most important part is kept widely separate, even in a presidential speech, from any talk that is concerned with the institutions and organization of public education. The philosophic basis for this remarkable uh, view of education is to be found in the treatises of John Locke, above all others both in his greatest work of political theory, the Second Treatise of Government, and in his treatise on education, Locke speaks repeatedly of the importance of moral education for the success of a free, civil, liberal society. But while moral education is of supreme importance to the nation, and therefore to the government, it is not, Locke insists, a responsibility or a duty of government. Education is, and I quote now this treatise on education, the duty and concern of the parents. 
Locke is deeply uneasy about government-sponsored moral and civic education because he is well aware that religion is always at the heart of such education. And he aims to provide the foundation for a liberal political society which will be characterized not merely by a separation of church and state that had existed since 1100, but by an unprecedented privatization, an extreme disestablishment of religion. And he knows that's only possible if moral education ceases to be a public concern. But it's not only Locke's concern with liberating individual souls from the coercive hand of governmental authority that leads him to recommend private education in the home. Because Locke is just as severely critical of private schools, especially boarding schools, as he is of public schools. He doesn't like any schools. He says they're all bad vehicles for education. And he, by the way, was educated in schools, private academies. And to see how what a remarkable departure this Lockean attack on schooling is in the name of education from the English tradition that preceded him, all one has to do is look back two generations before to the previously greatest English statement on education, John Milton's treatise on education, which is the last great statement in the English language of the classical Republican educational ideal. Milton had positively argued for collective education in schools for all uh, three young uh, uh, males at least, and he had stressed that like, in a good school the young men would live together, boarding schools, I mean, you know, of course, the source of the great English uh, pension for boarding schools, <coughs> the schools in which young men would live together in troops, as he put it, with sword play, half hour every morning to begin the day, <laughs> learning to live and act together with others in a team spirit, lots of rough sports out there on the field so that they would become ready for the civil militia ready to you know, fight the papers, uh, and, lock, uh, and, and for the duties of civic citizenship that are understood to grow out of the collective civil militia, which is, of course, a great theme of Aristotle's politics as well as Plato's laws. Now, Locke, in contrast, the history of this on education says nothing about preparing the young for military service, and draws attention, on the contrary, to the pernicious influence crowds of inevitably crude, rude, and rowdy boys have on one another's character development as reasonable beings in classrooms. He argues for the advantages that would accrue from a vast educational reform in England that would assimilate the education of boys to that of the girls, which he holds up as the model for the education of the future. And he talks in glowing terms of the control parents achieve over a little girl's environment and how much better that would be as the source of education for young boys, brought up in the bosom of the private home under the loving and painstaking supervision of their parents with the assistance of a carefully selected and well-paid private tutor. Bach talks about the need to diminish the legacy that's necessary in order to get a really good tutor like they have for the girls. And this means, of course, that Locke's treatise on education has in direct view exclusively the children of that small minority of the population constituted by the gentry and the nobility who can afford all of the leisure as well as the expensive private tutors for their boys as well as their girls. And he tries to persuade the upper classes to devote much more of their time, money, and thought to the upbringing of their own children, especially the boys as well as the girls, than was the custom in his, or earlier, or indeed in later, or in any time that's known to us. And one could say, as, as Professor Nathan Tarkov had in his excellent book, from which I have learned a lot, that Locke makes the challenge of educating, of governing, or ruling one's own children, the heirs to one's own property, an attractive and more natural supplement <coughs> to, or even replacement for, the classical challenge of a public life, participating in the rule and being ruled over one's fellow citizens. Locke directs his message to the upper class because he sees no prospect in the immediate future of families in the lower station possessing the leisure and financial resources required to carry out the time-consuming, difficult, and complex labor that Locke conceives to be necessary for a truly sound and effective moral education. But Locke makes it clear that he hopes and expects that a reform under his auspices 
of upper class education, and character, and outlook will have a profound, indirect, but profound long-term long -term impact on the way of life of the whole nation and parents and children at every level, as indeed it did. Now, the goal of Lockean moral education is the formation in the little boy, as well as in the little girl, of an enlightened self-interest, grounded in <coughs> rational self-control. And the self-control is buttressed, and the self-interest is enlarged by a sense of dignity rooted both in shrewd management of private property, preferably landed property, and in the unheroic but solid good name or recognition bestowed by one's similarly rational and independent-minded neighbors. That's the chief goal. Now, the chief task to achieve that goal, in Locke's view, is instilling in children a capacity to master their natural inclinations, or as he often puts it, their natural wrong inclinations. Because, according to Locke, human beings are naturally inclined to a lust for power and dominion that tends to violent conflict. And nowhere is this clearer, Locke says, than on playgrounds. <laughs> Watch little children, Locke says. Watch them especially when the teacher's back is turned and you watch nature coming to its fore. And nature means a movement towards mutual extinction that they were left to themselves. <laughs> Golding's Lord of Flies, just this sort of you know, Locke's piece on education put to music, so to speak. Uh, the human beings need to acquire an inner rule of reason, which is by no means their natural tendency or inclination, if they're to escape from the chaotic, mutually threatening sociability, the state of nature, uh, which is the human essence. Locke, of course, never says that human beings are radically alone by nature. He says they're social. They're locked in social relationships, like desire to kill, desire to dominate, desire to, uh, to, to rape and pillage, all social, intensely social relations, just uh, uh, not particularly uh, pleasant. But human nature is such that it by no means automatically, or even naturally, by way of its inclination, grows toward a non-warlike sociability. The defects and disorders of the mind to which education must respond are never ascribed by Locke to sin or to the fall. And accordingly, he never suggests in his treatise on education that the remedy for the human condition is uh, prayer or fear of God uh, or hope or divine grace and redemption. Uh, Locke uh, steers wide of that, despite what some uh, curious scholars like John Donne have tried to say, which is nothing in the treatise on education about sin or about redemption of religion. The proper remedy, Locke says, in the treatise on education for the natural, perfectly natural, disorders of the soul is an artificial implantation, beginning when very young, of habits of self-control, control, resting initially on fear, terror, and eventually, rather quickly, he thinks, if you get them frightened enough at the beginning, on a reconstruction of their little natural lusts for power, together with a modulation of their natural desire, and it is a natural desire, for pleasure and liberty. Now, what can give rationality or virtue its greatest strength in the human heart are, and here I'm quoting Locke, esteem and disgrace, which are, of all others, the most powerful incentives to the mind when once it is brought to relish them. And the mind can be brought to such relishing of prestige and, sh and fear of shame because the natural desire, which is for power and dominion and, the, and overcoming others as well as one's environment, can rather easily be linked in a way that a child can see very quickly to prestige. And prestige is so conventional in its character that you can structure the little character's environment so that they will quickly see that they get the most prestige by being decent and reasonable, or appearing to be so. And that's the first step of what you can be And in a rational, lucky, and home environment, praise and blame, once the child has been taught that prestige correlates with eating and disgrace with starvation and things like that, they realize prestige is very important. And then the prestige can be correlated with the display or lack of display of reasonableness. Children, and I quote Locke again, love to be treated as rational creatures sooner than is imagined. Tis a pride should be cherished in them, 
and as much as can be made the greatest instrument to turn them by. Now, Locke's stress on the grounding of virtue in habits instilled in very early childhood. He says you can start to make them care for prestige long before they can talk or walk. It echoes <coughs> Plato's teaching. Plato, too, had talked about the crucial importance. Start, Plato starts even earlier in the womb. He says it's important to start with the mother to do certain things to get the habits going. But Locke sharply disagrees with Plato over the natural basis that you're trying to plug into these habits, and hence the actual substance of this situation. Locke rejects the notion, handed down from the Greco-Roman classics, but also from the biblical tradition, that virtue conceived as noble, and not merely as useful or pleasant or advantageous or prestigious, has an intrinsic attraction to and a rootedness in human nature as part of an essential human <coughs> longing for self-transcendence and, and self-overcoming in the name of higher sources of meaning and devotion. Like on Aristotle and says that's part of human nature. Locke says, no, that's not at all part of human nature. That's artificial where it exists. Instead, Locke insists that the artificial sense of shame is, I quote him here, the only true restraint belonging to virtue. There ain't nothing else. He says. It's shame and that's what it's found in. That's the only thing. And nowhere in Locke's treatise on education are children oriented towards heroism or self-sacrifice or sublime asceticism <coughs> of a call to an imitation of the sufferings and labors of Christ. There's very little, if any, reference to the great classical civic educational themes of patriotism or military heroism, passionate friendship or love. The inspiration of poetry and the other fine arts plays at best a subordinate role in Locke's educational doctrine. And Locke does not suggest that an attachment to specific heroes or heroic models in history or literature ought to play an important role in moral education. Hunting, which is such an important part of the classical republic of education, has no place in Locke. And uh, that the one part of the American Bill of Rights, which one can say is absolutely unlocking, is the right to keep and bear arms. That would come from Milton and, and the English classical on a more mundane level, Locke criticizes moral upbringing that great devotes much energy to the attempt to still instill in children a sense of duty or uh, an adherence to rules, setting the tone of what uh, Dewey called progressive education. Locke teaches that as much as possible, parents should induce in the little <coughs> child a real desire to do what ought to be done, a real joy in doing it, and not a sense of duty or overcoming. The appeal should be not only to the child's primitive, and Locke admits it's pretty primitive, reasoning, but above all to their pride in thinking they're being reasonable, and to the natural delight all human beings feel in being free from, con free from constraints or rules or duties. As Locke says, none of the things the little ones are to learn should ever be made a burden to them or imposed on them on a task, as a task. Whatever is so proposed presently becomes irksome. Is it not so with us grown men? What we do cheerfully of ourselves, do we not presently grow sick of and can no more endure as soon as we find it's expected of us as a duty? Now, he recognizes pitfalls in this advice, but he insists that with great care and vision they can be avoided. And he does, makes it clear he does not mean that the child should be indulged, far from it, or allowed to do <coughs> just as it wishes at every moment. The environment should be structured, the child should be led by habit, by praise, by shame, by blame, to begin to learn the joy of exercising that self-control, that self-denial, not as a duty, but as a pleasure, as a sense of strength, independence. Uh, especially that self-control, he says, that consists in the mind's capacity to shift from something that is fun to something that is not fun, <coughs> but which the mind can see will bring more prestige and more security in the long run. And the most powerful lever here, he says, is example. Watching daddy or mommy enjoying something and suddenly saying, oh, time for me to stop golf and get to church, son. Let's go to church. Isn't this great to be able to stop playing when you want to stop playing? And that kind of thing. That block says is the real, uh, the real lever. Show them how wonderful you feel about being able to say, yeah, no more. Now, many have said this or something similar. 
but no one prior to Locke <coughs> went so far in reducing the fixed natural inclinations that we're born with to zero, and thereby transforming human beings, especially during little childhood, into moral and spiritual chameleons. This indeed is his term, and I quote him here. Children, nay, and men do, do most by example. We human beings are all a species of chameleons that still take a tincture from things near us. Uh, Lockean education culminates in the inculcation of the social virtues, which represent the rational, constructed, or artificial antidote to the naturally vicious, irrational, dom dominating proclivities of human sociability. Uh, in Locke's words, children who live together often strive for mastery, whose wills shall carry it over the rest. Now, whoever begins such a contest should be sure to be crossed in it. And not only that, but they should be taught to have all the deference, complacence, and civility for one another <coughs> imaginable. And this, when they see it procures them respect, love, and esteem, and that they lose no superiority by it, they'll take more pleasure in it than an insolent domineering. Justice, in the strictest sense, Locke says, children can't have, because it depends on owning private property, and they can't own private property. <laughs> so they can't know justice, but they can be brought toward justice, Locke says, because they can be taught a respect for other people's property, and some understanding of it, partly through being shown in a vivid way the meaning of labor. Locke says children should be forced to make all their own toys with the help of the tutors and the parents, of course. You see why it takes a lot of time to raise a child during a lot. Never purchase toys. Always make them, build them, and then they'll see what it means to have to work for something. And in the second place, by being taught the goodness of the virtue of generosity and the evil of the vice of covetousness, an evil that Locke invades against with, with uh, uh, veritable fervor. Now, he says, the appeal to love or to sacrifice is certainly not the proper way to instill the virtue of generosity any more than any other virtue. And he stresses, generosity is not charity, a word that he almost never uses uh, in, at any point in his writings, it's certainly not in the treatise on education. He does not suggest children be taught charity. They should be taught generosity. And what that means, Locke makes clear by showing how they're taught it, they can be made reliably generous by showing them that every act of generosity brings <coughs> profit, uh, and that they always acquire more if they give something away. Let them find by experience, writes Locke, that the most liberal always has the most plenty, with esteem and commendation to boot, and they'll quickly learn to practice it. This should be encouraged by great commendation and credit, and constantly taking care that the little fellow loses nothing by his liberality. Let all the interest instances he gives of such freeness be always repaid and add the interest. <laughs> the keystone of the social virtues, though, is what Locke calls civility, a word that he brought into the English language in its contemporary meaning, because originally civility means the virtue of political participation. Civility is the virtue of the citizen, of the kiwitas. Locke uses the term and taught the world, the English-speaking world to use it in a new sense. He doesn't mean by it political leadership, as it has meant, for instance, in Milton or statecraft, or even citizenship, he, as it, if you will, <coughs> transforms a political into a social virtue, a virtue that embodies an egalitarian sense of humanity. <coughs> uh, indeed, while Lockean civility is observant of conventional distinctions of rank and station, it's a social virtue which he says that children should above all be taught by having to practice it to any servants where they are so that they make it clear in their practice, and you make it clear as a parent, that you both know that by nature the servants are equal to you, that it's all just conventional, uh, and that therefore they're, they're, they're owed all the respect that anyone else is owed. Right? Part of civility, in the last point of view, is a quiet subversion of the English uh, social hierarchy, which, of course, Locke was very much against. Uh, and uh, it's the great, uh, you could say, uh, uh, the great opponent in the list against the classical virtue of vainglory or pride. Of course, Aristotle and the ethics have made the highest of the virtues uh, next to justice. It's the replacement, you can also say, of the biblical virtue of humility, which Locke makes clear he doesn't set much stock by. 
Uh, he defines it in a way this way, most, most evocatively or powerfully. He says, if we practice the virtue of civility, we know that we ought not to think so well of ourselves as to stand upon our own value and assume to ourselves a preference before any others because of any advantage we may imagine we have over them. We ought modestly to take what is offered when it is our due, and civility of the mind is that general goodwill and regard for all people which makes anyone have a care not to show in his carriage and any contempt, disrespect, or neglect of any other human being. Now, by the middle of the 18th century, Locke's uh, influence in America, the influence of his educational treatise in particular, partly by way of, of intermediaries such as uh, John Clark and Isaac Watts, but partly just directly by the fact that people were reading the book itself, was massive. There were older educational writings and theories, and especially those coming from the Christian tradition, which around 1750 were, were surely not cast into oblivion yet, but just as surely they were under relentless pressure, either to reinterpret and revalue themselves in Lockean terms, or to take up what proved to be a rather desperate struggle against the new wave of Lockean and post-Lockean educational thinking. And testifying vividly to this state of things is the most remarkable and influential American contribution to the discussion of education in the mid-century, Benjamin Franklin's 1749 book, Proposals Relating to the Education of Youth in Pennsylvania, followed in the next year, 1750, by another book, Idea of English School. These are books that have, uh, are full of footnotes, long footnotes, uh, all almost all dominated by references to Locke's treatise on education. And nevertheless, however um, numerous, substantial, explicit the borrowings from and the implicit dependence on Locke, we can't fail to notice that Franklin's whole project in these two books departs in a decisive respect from Locke. And the nature of the departure may be said to be archetypical of the distinctively American path in education. Because Franklin's project in these books is the establishment of a school an academy, the Academy in Philadelphia, the first great American academy. And this academy represented, of course, uh, as some of you will know, the avant-garde of a grand new army of private and then eventually public secondary schools to which Americans were to entrust the education of the leading citizens of the future. Uh, his writings had only limited success in the very near term, but in 1778, with the founding of Phillips Andover Academy, the, the snowball started to roll down the hill. Then all over America, these academies sprang up everywhere after Philip Sandler. <laughs> Franklin refers uh, for his fundamental principles to Locke, but he combines with the references to Locke, many of which I've really taken from Franklin here, uh, a stress on the value of schooling, something that Locke, as I made clear, had opposed. And what he says about it are such things as the value of public debates in school, where young people are forced to stand up and make an argument in front of their peers, especially if those debates are over uh, burning political issues. He characteristically talks about how much journalism should be taught in schools, because journalism, he says, is the fora of our world. Uh, it's going to be journalism and more than public debate in the assemblies through which people can express themselves politically. So journalism moves to the center, and journalism means setting the children uh, a theme from some burning political issue of the day and seeing who can write the best editorial on it and then letting them get up and read their editorial. In other words, he talks about various ways in which the very collectivity of the schoolroom can be turned into a kind of practice ground for Republican life in the new American system. All uh, a striking departure, if not from the spirit, certainly from the letter, and the details of Locke's education, a, a much more Republican and, and uh, to some extent, classical note enters fr uh, Franklin's uh, writings on education. And as they followed Franklin's lead, Americans who spoke out about education in the 18th century became increasingly conscious of the fact that in advocating and designing formal schooling in accordance with Franklin's principles, they were, in effect, shaping a new synthesis of Lockean and classical Republican educational principles. Now, to some extent, of course, it's true that the late 18th century American concern with formal schooling uh, builds on the peculiarly <coughs> strong traditions of public schooling in the New England states, especially Massachusetts and Connecticut, 
But I think a closer look shows the very limited degree to which this is really the case, at least as regards the spirit set in motion by Franklin. The cultivation of Puritan uh, religious spirituality, as you probably know, was not a favorite with Benjamin Franklin, uh, and not even the Quaker spirituality, which he was more surrounded with in Philadelphia, uh, is a goal in any recognizable sense of the academy that he proposed and set up. And this isn't to say that Franklin's proposal, or the academy itself, for that matter, uh, expelled religion from the school, but he very clearly treated religion as, at best, a necessary supplement to rather than the guiding light and inspiration for morality. And the religion he taught is what he calls civil religion, or public religion. And it makes it clear that means that minimal popular creed, which history, especially classical, i.e. pre-Christian history, is shown to be essential for social health. Now, after the ratification of the Constitution and the enactment of the Bill of Rights, the question of whether the Republic was to establish a system of public schooling took on a new urgency in a few minds. I skip over the founding for the very simple reason that, as far as I know, nobody at the founding ever talked about public education. Uh, certainly in the Federalist Papers, uh, I think we've been looking in vain for even the word uh, uh, to be mentioned. And if you read the debates, uh, Mad Madison's notes, I think one comes away astounded uh, by the degree to which they could have nothing to say about public education in the United States. Uh, some people tell me, well, they expected the states to take care of it. Uh, so it's amazing that they never said that. And it's also amazing that when they went home to their states, they didn't do a damn thing about it either. So uh, I doubt that that's the case. Uh, those who did talk about it were not people who were leaders of the founding. They were people like Benjamin Rush, Noah Webster, who were close to Benjamin Franklin, who, who did talk about it, but of course was a very old man at the time of the founding. And figure. Rush and Webster, though, did talk about it, and they felt there was something uh, desperately important missing in the American founding. And they tried to promote a public educational system that would, uh, that would marry a non-sectarian, Protestant, Christian public spirit with the ethos of self-government and commercial and agrarian enterprise that was going to be the moral core of the new republic. Uh, but their efforts didn't get very far. As most of you know, there were no public schools established in the United States for, uh, well, for generations. Uh, but another figure who was also not president of the Constitutional Convention, but who was very important in the founding, and somewhat indirectly, did devote a great deal of effort of thought, the only one, I think, that devoted a great deal of effort of thought of the major figures to the attempt to establish public schools, and that, of course, was Thomas Jefferson. But he parted company with Rush and Webster two lesser founders who were closest to him in this regard, inasmuch as he was disinclined to base civic spirit on uh, religion in any form whatsoever, even on the rather diluted generic form that Franklin had called public or civil religion. Jefferson sought instead public schools and textbooks that would inculcate a new, uh, historically unprecedented, purely secular moral code of liberal, agrarian or yeoman citizenship. And a crucial ingredient of the Jeffersonian program was the notion that the government of the schools should be placed in local and parental hands. And this is what he tried to bring about in the state of Virginia, with, of course, a total lack of success, as you know, probably. Uh, he hoped, though, to exploit the concern with educating children, male and female, too, he always stressed, resident within each local ward, as he called these envisaged uh, local community uh, school systems, so as to draw the boys and girls, parents, guardians, or friends, as he put it, out of their purely private, economic, and familial spheres into a public uh, argument and debate over the management <coughs> of schools. He hoped, in other words, that the wards would plant a kernel of classical life, republicanism, uh, that from which could grow a more generally active, participatory, republican concern and activity at the local level, transforming these wards from mere school districts into hotbeds of local <coughs> republicanism. Begin them only for a single purpose, Jefferson confided to his comrade-in-arms, Joseph Cavill, in a famous letter on the wards in 1816. He's still fighting 1816, old man for this. They'll soon show for what others they are the best instruments. 
In other words, the Jeffersonian educational vision for education in brought education, excuse me, brought concern for early childhood education into an organic unity, you could say, with concern for adult civic education through the practice and habituation brought about by, in a certain sense, benevolently tricking the adults into getting educated through taking care of their children's education. And I think it's indeed striking to compare our contemporary leaders' declarations of the goals and purposes of public education with Jefferson's most authoritative statement on the subject. You'll notice that especially the governors love to talk about their Jeffersonian meetings on education. You read the notes of these meetings, and it's obvious that not one of them knows anything about what Jefferson thought about education. You'd think they'd have an advisor who would have read the letters or something so they could make such errant fools of themselves. But no, this constant proclamation of Jeffersonian uh, educational ideals that has literally nothing in common with what Jefferson said about education. Uh, his great statement comes most clearly in a, in a remarkably succinct and yet capacious preamble to the 1779 Virginia Bill for the More General Diffusion of Knowledge, a bill that did not come off, of course, but he wrote it. And the preamble begins with a ringing appeal to the natural rights belonging to individuals, the protection of which Jefferson reaffirms is the purpose of and the criterion for good government. But then Jefferson moves at once to the need for popular political education in political science, by which he means above all political theory, the theory of the American Constitution, Montesquieu, Locke, Federalist Papers. Uh, Knowledge, as he puts it, of the forms of government, especially through the study of history, not social history, not economic history, political history, and foreign affairs. And this education, he says, is an education not simply of individuals, but of individuals united, partly by their education, into what Jefferson calls the people at large. And he goes on to say it's the people as a community or collectivity who possess, but possess only in their educated communal unity, the natural powers, as he puts it, to secure the natural rights that belong to them as individuals. But informed popular watchfulness is by no means the whole of Jefferson's civic educational goal. Because in the second half of this great document, this preamble to the unsuccessful bill, he proceeds from the common education of all citizens to the uncommon education the rare and selected few, especially among the poor, he says, whom, I quote him now from the preamble, whom nature hath endowed with genius and virtue. These should be rendered by liberal education, worthy to receive and able to guard the sacred deposit of the rights and liberties of their fellow citizens. And they should be called to that charge without regard to wealth, birth, or other accidental condition or circumstance. So he proposed the free tuition and support of all poor children who made it up to these higher grades, first at the high school and then at the University of Virginia. So the idea was, uh, of course, a very classical idea. Somebody's going to have to rule. And the important thing is that the few who are most virtuous and have the genius to do it, who are called out without regard to anything except their merit, should be brought to it by the educational system so that they have the education that makes them able to be the sacred deposit of the power that the people have to invest in. Now, he neither ignored nor underestimated the importance of vocational and technical education, or of giving, as he put it, I quote now from the later Rockfish Gap Commission report, giving to every citizen the information he needs for the transaction of his own business to enable him to calculate for himself and to express and preserve his ideas, his contracts, and accounts in writing. That's part of it. But Jefferson always insisted on putting in the foreground, or at the summit of the declarations of educational goals, the moral and civic dimensions of, for leaders and for followers. Now, the specific civic spirit aimed at by Jefferson and the other educational theorists among the founding generation involved, of course, a passionate patriotism and a sense of fraternity or solidarity with fellow citizens in past and future, as well as present generations. But both the patriotism and the fraternity were of a new sort, deeply planted in the soil of property rights and personal rights of individuals. 
love of country in this new educational vision was to be love not simply of the land and the people, the blood, the soil, the traditions, but a love of the principles of political theory, of political philosophy found in Locke and the Federalist Papers, <coughs> and the economic theory found in Adam Smith and so on. A proud sort of love of a nation as rational, principled beings with, with a clear theory behind them. A theory, of course, that's expressed in universal uh, truths. Mingled with respect for the statesmen uh, and even reverence for the heroes who were most fully dedicated to those specific principles. And care for one's fellow citizens was to express not so much selflessness, Jefferson wasn't great on selflessness, didn't think much of it, or even self-transcendence in any heroic classical sense, as the rational understanding that the rights of each depended on the rights of all. Heroic fight for that kind of idea, that you wanted, but the kind of enlightened uh, heroism, you might say, a knowledge that in fighting, you're fighting somehow for yourself, your own family, your own property, as well as others. And the heart of the matter, I think, is very well expressed by a young disciple of Jefferson, named Samuel Harrison Smith, who won a prize in 1795 that was set by the American Philosophical Society, which asked for an essay contest on principles for American education. And he said, he put it this way, he said, what we're looking for is a citizen enlightened who will be a free man in the truest sense. He will know his rights and he will understand the rights of others, discerning the connection of his interest with the preservation of those rights. He will as firmly support those of his fellow men as his own. Notice he doesn't say more firmly, as firmly. Too well informed to be mis misled, too virtuous to be corrupted. We shall behold man consistent and inflexible. Not at one moment the child of patriotism and at another the slave of despotism. We shall see him in principle, forever the same. And the specific character of this new kind of patriotism was, was made clearer by uh, an essay by Noah Webster called uh, On the Education of Youth in America, uh, in which he spoke of making as the principal school book, starting in the first grade, a book of political theory and political history. And then he made good on it. He wrote and published a series of such books that sold literally millions of copies. We're selling, I think the last edition was 1920-something. Uh, you can find them in any library. These were the core of education in America, and they were fantastically successful. Uh, proved, in other words, that uh, you could do it. He did it. He became quite uh, well off and famous with that in the dictionary. Uh, and he spoke of the need to inculcate not only principles of political theory on the, the little kids, but principles of commerce, money, and government in general. Uh, now, shining through the writings of these early Americans who did reflect deeply, the minority who did reflect deeply on the nature of a modern Republican civic education, there's discernible a specific notion of self-respect, popular self-respect. And it's put, I think, best by John Adams in a letter of 1785 on education where he says, the people must be taught to reverence themselves. Uh, meaning to say, he makes it clear, uh, 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 what he has in his mind's eye is a widely diffused sense of dignity rooted in real independence of property, property rights, spirit based on that economic basis, and a real understanding of moral and political principles a sense of reverence for the laws as one's own laws that were made by one as well as obeyed by one, uh, and one's own institutions, uh, a reverence that would avoid both the childlike awe of paternalistic <coughs> aristocracy and the vulgar incapacity for reverence, the, the uh, populistic mass self-congratulation that they feared they saw emerging uh, in the French Revolution. And the extraordinary difficulty or delicacy of the task, I think, becomes clearer when we see that what's sought is at one and the same time a, uh, a self-consciously sovereign people, vigilant against overweening personal ambition and bureaucratic usurpation of liberty, but at the same time a people respectfully, inviolably, inviolably obedient to the law and to lawful, legitimate authority and leadership. Non-contradictory but paradoxical and difficult combination of pride and humility rooted in a clarity of political understanding. And for the breeding of this kind of sentiment, these first American Republicans spoke repeatedly of the significance of the education of women, of women. 
Now, both Locke and the classical Republican philosophers had made uh, the uh, early childhood moral education absolutely important, and therefore had stressed the absolute importance of the education of women. I think this term, <coughs> of no great political philosopher has spoken about education has not stressed the importance of educating women. But uh, the Americans adopted this, but they, they characteristically transformed it in their own way. And it was Noah Webster, again, who put the theme, I think, in its clearest light in that same essay I mentioned a, a moment ago. He says, in a system of education that should embrace every part of the community, the female sex claims no inconsiderable share of our attention. The women of America, to their honor it is mentioned, are not generally above the care of educating their own children. Their own education should therefore enable them to implant in the tender mind such sentiments of virtue, propriety, and dignity as are suited to the freedom of our governments. In order to prevent every evil bias, the women whose province it is to direct the inclinations of children on their first appearance and to choose their nurses should be possessed not only of amiable manners, but of just sentiments and enlarged understandings. Uh, and the author Webster himself didn't draw the conclusions implied in these observations as much as did his comrade uh, in arms, Benjamin Rush, who wrote a famous essay called Thoughts on Female Education Accommodated to the Present State of Society, Manners, and Government in the United States of America, 1787, the year of the founding. Rush began from the observation that if mothers were to inspire a sense of dignity in a society whose independence was to be grounded on economic matters, on property rights, on the widest possible diffusion of ownership, and where most families were going to require the close cooperation of husband and wife in managing the family finances and property, then women had to learn economics. And accordingly, he stressed that the new public education he looked for would be one in which women would study not just English, but bookkeeping, arithmetic, geography, the history of the nation, including especially its struggle for freedom, and above all, principles of political theory, modern political theory. Some women, at least, Rush said, must gain a general acquaintance with the first principles of astronomy and natural philosophy, by which he means physics, of course. He praised the training in uh, vocal music, <coughs> especially uh, church singing, and reluctantly allowed training in dancing, which is traditional things. But he had to draw the line at instrumental music, piano practice. No place in America, he said, for that kind of aristocratic nonsense. <laughs> uh, in the place of this, he tried to substitute the cultivation in girls of a habit of serious reading and uh, deploring the time American girls spend on things like harpsichords and so on. He says, how many useful ideas might be picked up in these hours from history, philosophy, poetry, and the numerous moral essays with which our language abounds. And finally, he said, it'll be necessary to connect all these branches of education with regular instruction in the Christian religion, because Rush very characteristically, unlike most of the other founders, continued to think that common religion was essential and that women were at the heart of any kind of common religious instruction. Uh, now, his vision and views found their most powerful advocate in a woman who was born the year he delivered this address I've been quoting from, 1787, the great Emma Willard, one of the greatest uh, American uh, thinker on uh, public education. Uh, in 1819, Emma Willard presented to the governor of New York a long, meditated, and well honed proposal for the creation of a system of state-supported seminaries for women based on the principles of Benjamin Rush and Noah Webster. But she took their thought one crucial step further. She argued in this paper, which of course was not adopted by the governor of the legislature, that the education begun in the home by American mothers, who themselves had to be educated in state seminaries, didn't exist yet, would have to continue in state-established primary schools. And in these primary schools, she insisted, the most apt and available teachers would be the women, not the men. In other words, she spearheaded what was to become the, the most striking new feature of education that America could contributed to education in a way, the feature, feature almost completely unforeseen by the founders, namely the transformation of the educational profession particularly in the primary grades, by the overwhelming predominance of women teachers as moral exemplars as well as instructors. But the substance of Willard's educational vision, like that of the earlier founders from which she drew inspiration, met with no more than a very partial success. I mean, she went on to form 
some famous private schools, the Academy of Troy and so on, but she never got government backing. And the conception of education that, that she took over in 1819 and that Jefferson had at the same time and the truth and these earlier thinkers I talked about was uh, discarded uh, to some degree from the very beginning in America. It was never taken very seriously outside these, uh, these few voices. It was generations before America established any public schools in the middle of the 19th century. And then it was in response to very different concerns arising out of uh, uh, maturing capitalism and industrialization, urbanization, worries about uh, crime and disorder and the need to uh, teach the youth to become uh, efficient members of uh, the growing global economy. But perhaps the time has come for a careful reconsideration of the possibility of resuscitating the goals of these original educational proposals. And even the applicable parts of the curricular means they suggested. No question uh, there would be required appropriate transformations reflecting the transformations that have occurred, and the transformations in American society. America no longer exhibits even the degree of religious consensus that Rush believed he had to work with. And uh, the rural and landowning backbone of the yeoman society Jefferson and Webster look to has disappeared. But, as the recent words of President Bush indicate, the nation still recognizes the need to communicate to our children a reverence for the past that incorporates us into a society whose freedom is more than the freedom of individuals hermetically sealed into the present time, the personal sphere, the immediate place. There still lives a heritage of civic virtues, virtues of gratitude, generosity, struggle at home and abroad, of sacrifice for freedom rather than just enjoyment of freedom, of faith in the one God whose oneness inspires and helps weld our oneness as a nation, all quoting from President Bush. And there still lives the confidence that these virtues can be taught in part through telling the story, as President Bush said. May it not be time to make a more deliberate and determined effort to make this telling, and in addition, practices or habits that would reflect what has been told, the central part of the curriculum of our public schools. That's not entirely true, by the way. Let me take that back. Yeah. There is one place where he supports public schooling, and that's in his um, poor laws. He drew up poor, poor laws for England. And, and when it comes to the very poor who can't have any possible education in the home, he is for uh, forced public schooling to teach them discipline. So where there's really no possibility, yes, but I think the preference would be, the hope would be that another generation of those poor people would have the discipline to get jobs to raise kids by themselves in some degree. And it seems to me that is because Locke never ceases to think that religion is absolutely crucial 
Uh, it's a very tepid religion that he wants in the treatise on education, but that in itself is part of religious education to, to make it tepid and, and in sheer public fervor. Um, I'm not saying that the Franklin view is, is, is diametrically opposed to Locke, but it seems to me that Locke's educational thought is one of the most problematic aspects of his thought, and it is partly for that reason one of the most problematic aspects of our public culture. And, once, and that's why I started with the Bush speech, which I think, I think captures the problem perfectly. Bush somehow knows that we need public support for women, public direction to parents to raise their kids as decent citizens. And he also knows you can't talk about that as part of public education because you have everybody on your back. You can't do it that way. And yet somehow we also know that, you know, how can you have sex education and say nothing about what's right? Hey, if you say nothing about what's right, that's a statement about what's right. Uh, but we've got to have sex education. And similarly, drug education. How can you have drug education and not say some things are right and some things are wrong? Uh, and isn't that already <coughs> infringement on, on the separation of church and state, because there are some religions that believe the use of drugs is good. We see the Supreme Court case uh, outlawed the use of drugs by uh, Indian religions, and uh, I think it's uh, arguably an, uh, a violation of their rights under our Constitution. So uh, I think the problem of moral and religious education is at the heart of education. Locke saw that and therefore felt if we're not going to have the government directing people's souls, we should shy away from public education. And I think that uh, it's still true that the, again, going back to Bush's speech and the governor's, the main reason why people are concerned with public education in the United States, I think, is there are technical <coughs> training. They're afraid we'll fall behind the Japanese and not Pacific virtue in, uh, in cars and stereos. Secondarily, there's a concern with moral education, but that tends to be because people are afraid of crime, and drugs, and pregnancies. Very little talk about citizenship education. I think that's a real problem in this country. It reflects a problem right across the political spectrum. You won't find it on the left or on the right. And uh, I think it reflects a serious gap in the founding fathers, with the exception of the few I spoke about. But there were a few, above all Jefferson, who really were troubled by this gap and sensed it. Well, to what extent do you think that the Paideia proposal and program that Mortimer Adler and the Paideia group brought out seven years ago and which has been implemented in some schools addresses this? How do you think that fits into what you're saying, or are you familiar with it? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar enough with it to, to comment intelligently. I have just the vaguest idea of what's there. So I well, they, they, the Paideia title, uh, but it is a call for a return to a a liberal education with seminars and dialectic in schools. And if, if you haven't read it, I don't think you could answer the question. Yeah, I probably couldn't answer it intelligently. Uh, I did mean seriously what I said at the beginning about the distinction between philosophic education and civic education. Yeah. I do think those two are rather different. Yeah. And then what would be needed at the lower levels is more an education in our political traditions, our political principles, the, not to say a, a uh, indoctrination, but uh, rekindling the great debates, Federalist, Anti-Federalist, Lincoln, Douglas, uh, FDR, Progressive versus the uh, you know, uh, uh, Republican critics, to get people to relive the, the great turning points in our political evolution in order to see again the power of the arguments pro and con. That's the kind of thing I think that could be brought much more into the schools. Now, I don't know whether that would It would do it if you followed the list, but again, uh, it's something that has gone on quietly and it's not been picked up. Um, and it, it deserves it, it deserve now. Most people say you can't do that. Mm -hmm. It's too much. No. Uh, I was very interested in your, in your quote from Adams and his ideal of uh, reverence for the law, but the reverence for it being made by, by yourself. Um, I was wondering how you considered um, Lincoln as a change uh, from this, or I'm thinking in particular of Lincoln's speech. I wish I knew the exact name of it, but it's the one where he uh, talks about the warning against the tribe of the lion and the eagle, and he argues for reverence for the law, a simple reverence for the law, and kind of a constitution cult. And I wonder if you interpret how you interpret that 
That's the young man's life seems to be. Yeah, yeah, that's it. As either a failure of the founders, the few founders who have educational principles, or a, a change of them, or anything. It's been a long time since I read that speech, but as I remember, <coughs> it, is a, it is a criticism of the founders implicitly that they didn't uh, think enough about the. It's on the preservation of our public institutions. I think, I think the, the suggestion is that they didn't think enough about the preservation and the need for great leadership and also more citizenship. And I think Lincoln's whole career, uh, especially once he became president, with his invocation of, of <coughs> biblical rhetoric, second inaugural. High point, but also the Gettysburg Address, uh, in a way, the first inaugural, uh, the uh, proclamation of Thanksgiving. All of these things were, I think, meant to try to bring religion more powerfully to the center of American political life. And um, that's uh, certainly contrary to the spirit of Thomas Jefferson, who Lincoln evoked frequently, but not in this. So I think Lincoln was, uh, I would say, a high point of, of esteemed leadership, trying to bring religion, more biblical religion, more powerfully into American political life as a, as a, as a source of, of uh, as a sanction. Because of course, Lincoln faced the fact that, that he was asking tens of thousands of Americans to die, to kill other Americans for this country. And I, I think, uh, I don't think one can find a basis in law for that. I think Lincoln sensed that. It wasn't clear that one can find a basis <coughs> in the original principles as stated. It's <coughs> only something a little more open. Uh, and, and you remember Lincoln's uh, second inaugural, the threat it holds out, the second inaugural says, if we don't win this war, God will punish us. It will be much worse for us because God will get us. It was, it was a very, it's a very somber speech. It's, you know, it says, who knows if it isn't true that every drop of blood taken by the lash will be exerted from the free people. He said, if there's a just God, why not? So he seems to say in the second inaugural uh, that it's God's plan that these many men die. You know, this is our punishment. It's a very amazing statement from the American president. But that's what he said. You know, we deserve it. We're suffering for what we did. And Locke, you know, there's nothing in the founders that talks about a million men have to die for your sins. That's the question. Um, in what ways, I know this is probably a, a long and difficult question, but maybe you could outline something medical for me. Um, in what ways does Locke's vision of civic education contrast or compare with, with Rousseau's as presented in the Emile? Um, what in what ways is, is, is Rousseau's uh, savage who is to inhabit cities uh, akin or very different from uh, the, uh, <coughs> the, the, the vision of Locke? And more than that, uh, which, even when we look at uh, education today, I mean, who is really behind it all more, more and more? Is it, is it is a locking conception or, or, or Rousseau? -ing? That's a big question. <laughs> uh, That's what I thought. I, just <laughs> love it. I would just say two things about the comparison between Locke and uh, so scratching the surface, but I think maybe the two grooves that never start with. Locke's whole education, as I tried to bring out, is, uh, is, is the motor of moral education for Locke is, is, the, is the, the joy in prestige or recognition and the pain of shame or disgrace. Now, Rousseau calls that amour propre, meaning uh, vanity, meaning loving yourself as others see you. And he regards that as a very dubious, but not totally dubious thing. He criticizes Locke for having enslaved people too much to what others think, for, for turning people into what Rousseau called petit bourgeois, the bourgeois. The bourgeois in, in, in uh, the best formulation of Rousseau's bourgeois, I think, is Alan Bloom's. He says, the bourgeois, according to Rousseau, is the human being who, when he thinks of himself, thinks only of what other people think of him. When he thinks of other people, thinks only of what they do. Uh, 
somehow lost and yet selfish at the same time. Lost to others and yet selfish at the same time. Locke's view is, well, that's, that's what human freedom is all about. That's how you turn people from savages. You make them think about what other people will think of them, and you get them behaving properly. Rousseau has another great view. Well, that's the second thing I would say. Sex. Uh, Locke's treatise on education ends with the only mention of sex in the whole book. The last line is, having got the young man in sight of his mistress, we leave him to her. <laughs> so, uh, meaning to say, it has nothing to do with education. Whereas Rousseau, uh, although there's a pre-pubescent education that's very important, the real heart of education, according to Rousseau, is the schooling of the erotic imagination uh, for both men and women to lead to an artificial, from his point of view, but ultimately very strong bond, the, the loving couple, um, which became you know, the heart of romanticism and the whole of 19th century literature and was enormously influential in America uh, after the founding. It's something I didn't talk about at all, but that after the founding, uh, partly through a kind of transformation of Christianity through Rousseauian influence, but it's already visible in Benjamin Rush and to some extent with James Wilson, but I didn't talk about it much. This idea of women as the source of great power over men through eroticism and the proper education of women and men leading towards uh, the love interest which would create a kind of family as an island of uh, real affection, honesty, and wholeness in the sea of bourgeois commercialism. It's Rousseau's great dream and make the family the, the, uh, the bulwark of an alternative to the, uh, the bourgeois commercial world. And that worked for a long time in America. I mean, it's, it's only really disappearing now uh, in the last uh, generation. I mean, from Rousseau's point of view, Women in America are all being now corrupt and turned into bourgeois. Uh, from Locke's point of view, they're finally being awakened from that long Rousseauian nightmare and made capitalists like they should have been. Uh, you mentioned that um, in order to uh, teach about uh, sex education or drug education, um, you need to teach some sort of system of morality, or if you're not going to teach a system of morality, then you're still teaching morality no matter what. You, or you, that says something about what you should do. And um, I was wondering if uh, if you're arguing for, um, like, ground, like if you're going to teach a system of morality, are, are you going to ground it in religion, some kind of religion? Or if you're not going to ground it in religion, you said that's what usually people choose is religion uh, in order to ground their morality. Um, if it's not religion, then, then what, what would it be? I mean, what, what are you, what are you going to, are you going to go back to uh, ancient Greece and Plato or, or what? I, mean, I, I was curious. Well, no, I'd go back to Benjamin Franklin and, yeah. and, uh, and Benjamin Rush and Noah Webster and Thomas Jefferson. I mean, back to this sort of combination I tried to sketch of, of, of a sort of synthesis of Locke and the classics in a new democratic egalitarian perspective. So I'd go, I would say go back to the founding fathers and make citizenship education the heart of it. Okay, yeah. but, but that would have strong implications for sexual education, I think, because uh, yeah. the idea would be. Uh, uh, you're a good citizen, you don't have kids that you're not ready to bring up. Uh, you know, and I think uh, it would mean, you know, teaching a, a kind of responsibility and self-control that uh, would go along with the responsibilities of participation in a free society. So you wouldn't be saying, let's teach about Christian principles or anything like that? You'd, you'd be no, I don't, I mean, I don't, I'm not, I don't mean to be anti-Christian, but I don't, I think America, I think there's, and that's why I had mentioned uh, the problem of applying it some of Benjamin Rush just at the end. Benjamin Rush is the one person among the founding generation <coughs> who was very strong in making this a Christian country. Mm -hmm. And I think that was kind of doubtful from the beginning because of the religious diversity and the, and the free thinking in the country. So I don't think that can be at the heart of the public schooling. On the other hand, I do think there could be much more, I think our political culture, and starting with our Supreme Court, there could be much more uh, permission for religious intrusion of a modest sort into the public schools. So that the, the, I don't think there, would, there needs to be, I don't, in fact, I would argue there shouldn't be such, uh, uh, such a wall of separation between church and state. Now, the founders are divided on that. Jefferson is for that wall of separation, as I said. But Franklin and, and uh, Washington are, are not, I think. So there's kind of a division among the founders, and I think that the ones who were 
a little more relaxed in their fear of religion. Now, I'm not saying you should have you know, religious schools, but I, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't have, for example, tax-supporting parochial schools in some places. Works great in Canada. Do you believe that Locke would argue that with the, uh, the return of calls by many parents for value classes or things about to be reinstituted into the schools, that Locke would see that as indicative of kind of the failure of the American family structure to promote those values that he felt should have been at yeah. the heart of the family? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. I think he would be somewhat, Locke would be somewhat dubious about whether the schools can do much of that. I think. Um, Probably the classics would be two, but they might think it's worth trying a little bit. <coughs> what, is, what is the role of the economic structure and change in place of family and in their role in educating their children? That's, that's a good and a tough question because if I, under, if I understand what you mean, but uh, since uh, Locke was the great apostle of the free market, it is in a way the free market which is having a lot of effect in breaking up our family and making it so that women do have to work and making it feel that them feel quite rightly that they're not being provided with independent dignity by the traditional um, system. Well, Locke, um, Locke does talk about that somewhere. Locke thinks that an absolute linchpin of the family is the fear of the parents that they will be left alone and uncared for, unaccompanied at least, in their old age, unless they get the kids taken care of them. And on the other side, it's absolutely important for the kids to realize that they won't get any inheritance unless they go back. <laughs> he, he doesn't deny that there's love between generations. So, oh, actually, he uh, doesn't say much about the love of children for parents. He talks about parents loving children, and occasionally about children loving parents. But his view, I think, is love is lovely, but it doesn't knit people together like economic necessity. <laughs> so the general view of the family, I think, is that it's, it should be uh, relatively loose in terms of he's all for divorce, he endorses polygamy and polyamory. He says he sees no reason why you couldn't have more than one husband at a time with different contracts or different kinds of relationships. But when the children, as far as the children are concerned, whichever couple has the children, or insofar as there's a monogamous marriage, he can be very much against pensions or old age benefits that allow parents to think that they don't need their children. Because it's that spur of necessity that will make them work a little harder and get a little more money so that their kids know that the difference between pleasing mommy or daddy and not is getting or losing, let's say, a quarter of a million dollars. <laughs> that, he says there's nothing that so strongly attaches a child to his father. There's the knowledge that there's a sizable inheritance father will decide near the end how we will distribute it. So Locke was, I think, very much concerned with these economic incentives to knit the family together. And I think what's happened in our world is we're more humane than Locke. Locke, you know, is willing to let a lot of people go hungry in their old age who don't think ahead. And I think, you know, our world is one where we, we're more humane and compassionate. But the result is very few people think that they depend on their children in their old age. Most people think you can't depend on them. And we've designed inheritance laws and, and, and uh, state taxes so that it's much harder for children to think that, you know, you're going to get a lot. And Locke would have said, yeah, that's very nice, but you've screwed everything up that way. Because now you've taken away the incentives that he thought would knit the family together. And in particular, you see, would make it so that women would have a strong incentive both to take care of the children and to get independent sources of wealth. And that's why he, he, uh, he was all for sort of the emancipation of women as money makers, as long as they made the money with a view to knitting the children to them, take care of them, or be with them in their old age and so on. Does that help, Phil? Yeah. But I think uh, your question reveals that we have a great problem that Locke doesn't take care of very well, that is if a society becomes more compassionate than Locke envisages society being, and begins to think that it's the government that should take care of the old, and, the, and to some extent the children, and that uh, inheritance laws should redistribute uh, accumulated wealth. Much me these mechanisms that he thought would do the job aren't going to do the job. And the family will begin to come apart as a result. If you have the Lockean principles, you're not the Lockean support. Um, 
bolden by the last question to the trials in. Um, given that society has become more compassionate, won't the same thing happen in practice uh, here in education that happened in constitutional theory? Uh, with those people who talked about virtue and political uh, theory and justice uh, found their horror that when that actually became popular, uh, it was Ronald Gordon <coughs> who was actually writing the script from where he tried. Uh, isn't in fact, in practical terms, a return to moral education going to mean moral education of compassion, of egalitarianism, of a very universal and kind of soupy sort, um, and you know, pork and colder and the rest of it, rather than frankly, I mean, is this how serious a possibility you see the question? Well, yeah, I mean, that, that, uh, I suppose uh, that's certainly a, a, a danger, uh, but uh, what's the alternative? I mean, that, uh, that's the way, uh, I mean, is the alternative a drift in the direction you mentioned anyway? Um, together with uh, a kind of thoughtfulness about the most important aspects of education. I mean, uh, certainly I think what you mentioned is a real danger, um, but uh, I'm not sure that the, I, I think it's worth running the risk, partly because I don't see what the alternative is except slow rot. <laughs> 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 I think that's the way it goes anyway, but uh, I think it's worth you know, giving a try. At least, I, mean, I don't tend to expect uh, great reforms to arise from this kind of talk, but at least maybe some people be reminded of what it is. Natural science, of course, in the Republic and also in the laws, Plato says that, that is an important part to natural science, especially mathematics. But um, but I think the problem, with it's not, uh, and so I don't, I didn't, I, I, I skirted natural science, but a, a good education would include natural science, well, not so much the view of technical. But uh, the problem with natural science as such is that it doesn't really touch people's hearts. Like you can have a very well-trained technician. I think it's only when natural science is combined with serious inculcation of moral and religious principles that people begin to be troubled by the disproportion between the clarity and uh, uh, deductive power of relative unclarity and incoherence of morals and religion. And that would be uh, you know, a strong beginning point for some kind of philosophic reflection, to be troubled that way by the disproportion. I think that's why Plato thinks mathematics is so important, that it gives you a clear sense of what it means to know something. And when you bring that to the more important things, you realize how little one knows of those things that you thought were so 
sure of, and that troubling disharmony is the key to for old from philosophy. So in that sense, natural science is important, but just by itself, if it's not paired with and brought into a tense relationship to moral and religious principles, I think natural science can just lead to nothing beyond natural science. No, no real being troubled. We'll have nothing but harmony uh, at our reception of this lunch. I hope you all are coming. Thank you.